we have three speakers who give papers. And uh, you can see here the first two speakers. And, and then we have a break. And then Graham speaks. Then we have another short break. And then I give a little introduction to the panel discussion. discussion and questions, etc. And this topic, the digital lens, I think is really timely because people spend most of their life looking through a digital lens in one way or another, particularly with their cell phone. And uh, in doing my research, I found that Paul Clay, the artist, he wrote something called The Thinking Eye in uh, 1914. He was way ahead of his time. It's, it's a magnificent work, a few hundred pages. And uh, he was very much into color coding, et cetera. So he was obviously thinking about something like the digital lens. So our first speaker is Terrence Mason. I, I like to say Masson. <laughs> <laughs> and he is uh, based in New York. He is chair of the Computing Arts Department of the School of Visual Arts in New York. One of the major art schools in New York with students coming from all over the world. And Terrence has developed this program in very advanced ways. And uh, you're gonna, he's going to really focus his talk on education today with all the challenges that it has being in this digital period that we are. So I'm gonna ask Terrence to come up. <laughs> and if he wants to continue, he's in a little intro on himself. <laughs> on myself. <laughs> okay, if I don't use this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Look, I'm sure you can hear me in the back row. Zoom people be able to hear me. I think so. If you speak so, up, yeah. okay. I have no problem projecting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me let's see. Uh, I have a thing somewhere. Let's see. It was up. Uh -oh. oh wait a minute! Oh no, here it is. <laughs> Got another one. Fancy keyboards. Uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's hidden here somewhere. Work Chrome. I'm logged in. It's just as easy for me to uh, to call it up again. I think. Yeah. See, there we go. Done. And then let me get ahead of it, though. No, sorry. We got another one. Do this. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm Terrence. Um, and this is the, the topic. I was asked to talk a little bit about my career and the context that gave me into moving from production into education. So I'm not a trained career academic. Sorry. <laughs> um, did pixels for a living and then transitioned to education. It's about 15 years ago now. Um, when I took over and ran a program at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So I am chair of the MFA Computer Arts Department. I did take over for Bruce Wands uh, in 2016. I'm very grateful to Bruce for that. And that's how I know about this conference, because I knew Bruce came and spoke very highly. And it's a gorgeous building, by the way. This is the first time I've ever been here. Um, so... Hope somebody can take credit. <laughs> it's a great building. <laughs> um, many thank yous to everybody. Hope we got the various accreditations correct. But uh, we had a great dinner last night. So I get to know. <laughs> we did lots of great things following up from the conference. And I hope you all will too. So please get in contact and talk to me and visit me in New York. And let's collaborate across the pond and all that stuff. Um, so that's us, yeah, SVA. So SVAs, it was formed in 1947. Uh, I think it was Will Eisner, Herb Hogarth, and uh, my boss's dad, um, David Rose, Silas Rhodes was his name. 
So in my department is, uh, I took over when it was 30 years anniversary from Bruce in 2016. So we're about 35 years old now. Um, and we've got about 1300 graduates all over the world. So I'm very grateful to be there. Uh, the, actually, I didn't, I hadn't planned to say this, but whenever we see our time, the first thing I did when I took over from Bruce. So those of you who know Bruce in his career, he was a, a you know computer artist with a capital C A computer artist. I came from more techno geek visual effects, storytelling, animation, that kind of stuff, uh, video game development, AR XR. So the first thing I did when I took over the department was I asked the, the provost. I said, "Can I add an S?" <laughs> when I took over, it was MFA Computer Art, singular. And I had all these, and he said, yeah, I think we can do that. Yeah. So um, so that and the new logo that I designed, that's my big, and we don't have any deans to kibosh that kind of great ideas. So that's, I just got to add an F. Um, hope I can squeeze all this in, in in half an hour or 40 minutes. But uh, so this is just some of the official job titles that I've had over 35 years now. The most important being on the top and the bottom. Uh, I got three kids. Um, so I've had a great career. Timing was great. I'm just going to do a quick overview. So I get into feature of film visual effects pretty early. I grew up reading science fiction, programming, uh, you know, as a kid, but was not always an artist. So pencil and paper. So I immediately wanted to work on Star Wars, you know, work, work at ILM and that kind of stuff. So this is just some of the films that I. I contributed to some of, some of which were not bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then I also worked a lot in uh, video game technology, video game uh, pre rendered cinematics, uh, real time graphics, feature animated film, mostly on. I was talking to somebody about uh, um, I did a lot of digital cinematography. So I came from the practical side of stage work, visual effects supervision. Uh, and really gravitated towards digital lenses, digital cameras, and emulating that um, real world parameters of weight and momentum and, and just usage. Um, getting South Park, pitched in 96, um, and then going to DreamWorks and doing things like Shark Tale and Flushed Away to emulate like the Aardman aesthetic, right? Of their, they had a, a certain very limited lens package and a the same shooting stage that they did all their movies. So it, by, by its very nature, constricted the cinematography style of an Aardman film. So to do that, do I have that a little bit? No, oh yeah, flushed away, right. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of the animation side. And uh, oh, just a highlight on South Park, <laughs> which is still running, uh, which is amazing. Um, and I, so I'm I'm the red shirt guy on the left. I'm Terrence, I don't know who Philip is. <laughs> <laughs> My daughters think that's key. Oh, that's so cute. Um, and I, I put this up because I love, um, I'll talk about SIGGRAPH a little later, but the, the great thing about our fields, of, I mean, computer graphics in general, is I make the analogy of, and I came up with this, I take credit. <laughs> it's as if, if you're working in aerospace today, and we're flying, you know, yeah. all in 777s, and the Wright brothers were still alive and in their 80s and developing new technologies, and you could talk to them about, uh, what it was like to think up the concept of the wing and all this stuff. And that's really what CG is like, because you can talk to Ed Catmull and Jim Blinn and all, all these amazing seminal people who are still alive and, and active in our field. And I think that's amazing because I'm going to talk about history a lot. I love stuff. So that's the preamble. So, <laughs> yeah. so lifelong learning. So I am an educator. Um, and I just wanted to, I tried to narrow down my career with inspiration and wrapping up with modern stuff in these four topics. So collaboration is huge. So I mentioned I wanted to, and I did, a uh, combination of being naive, maybe, and uh, just, you know, pitching a resume to ILM back in uh, 1990. And this was the best example of collaboration working in film. I don't know of any other media medium that's more collaborative than film. So being there in, 1990. Um, so you say Wesky, traditional map painter. So this is when we were still doing traditional <laughs> painting on board. This is, you know, a traditional map painting that was then high resolution filmed. The film was scanned, put into a very early SGI on 3D geometry as a projection map so that we could do a little bit of a 
two and a half D camera move on it. This is for the opening of uh, Hook. Yeah, you know, flying down the Neverland. <laughs> so the the idea to be on stage with this stuff, and you know, we're shooting fiber fill clouds with cameras on tracks, and it was just amazing the collaboration across departments. The entire CG department was about fifty people. You know, it's it's been two thousand people for a long time. Um, that's what you we're working on here. Um, look at the size of those CRTs. The depth. Um, remember the degauss button on those things? And the sound they would make? Bonk. Um, so, yeah, so we were doing pre-production on the original Jurassic Park in 91. Wow. Um, yeah, and we made these maquettes uh, because Dennis Mira, the BFX soup, was uh, uh, really adamant about don't guess. Don't try to fake it in the computer before you go out in the real world. So we would take these these gorgeous things and just go out in the sun in the parking lot and see this, you know, the sun falling on them and see how the shadows and the softness and on a cloudy day and a sunny day at noon at sunset. And then you're like, okay, I've got that in my mind's eye now. Now, now go to the computer. <laughs> okay, staged. I staged this picture. Um, so um, I left. I am to go work for um, an icon um, hero of mine, Douglas Trumbull. Uh, and we set up, I set up a department called Image Engineering. So I was the image engineering supervisor for Douglas Trumbull. We were building this, uh, the Luxor Hotel, the big pyramid in Vegas. Uh, this was 92. Uh, we did three gigantic, I could talk for hours just about this one project. But one of the cool things, we had a stereo lithography machine, this brand new tech that was, you know, a vat of, polymer goo, intersecting UV lasers, and you would design things. You can tell beast blinds, remember those? NURBS, NURBS, um, in alias, and then, you know, print it out. And then we used, so 3D printing in 1992, but using the newest technology that's, that's coming out and sending it to the model shop that would make casts and then make duplicates of that thing. And then those things were used eighth and 16th scale miniatures on a shooting stage with a gantry crane that I programmed the moves for, and it would kill you if it wasn't controlled with the proper momentum and all that. Back to knowing how to control speed on a spline and a computer, knowing it's gonna be driving this two ton monstrosity. <laughs> um, yeah, so the again, the collaboration is what, what this is all about. Um, <laughs> one of the greatest tools we ever came up with so another a story about collaboration and analog technology in learning. So working at, fast forward uh, Phantom Menace, which was 1999, I think. Um, first new Star Wars movie in whatever it was, 25 years at the time. And we had a sequence. I was the supervisor for called the Stampede sequence. And um, very, very nascent early particle system technology back then. I mean, they existed, but very cumbersome, very expensive, very time consuming, not fast at all. And um, we just wanted to create splash. So we have live action plates of ferns and stuff that we shot in the parking lot and slapped on Liam Neeson. And then everything else is digital, uh, obviously with the, the critters and stuff. So <laughs> long story short, so Dennis Muir and I said, let's go to the shooting stage. We go to the shooting stage, grab a little kiddie pool, put trash bags, that we ripped open and laid in and it filled it with water, turned all the lights off, hit it with a spotlight, filmed it with just a video camcorder and a ladder to get the angle right, stomped around in the water. And we got like 20 minutes of random splash, small and big. <laughs> and then just digitized the video footage, did a you know, luminous key high con on it. And boom, in 40 minutes, got thousands of examples of splashes, things that were real. Meanwhile, the guy's still figuring out you know, how to do a particle system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gosh, and we're done. Yeah. So the story being embrace really simple analog tools and collaborate and, you know, don't get laser focused on the new shiny bubbles. Um, so I was really lucky to be brought up in that collaborative setting. Um, so creative industries, you all know what that term means. When I took over at Northeastern University, I wanted to make a program that combined the best, what I thought, opportunity of a, of a huge research university like Northeastern. So they had physics and business and law and music technology and graphic design and fine art and animation. So I, I said, nothing describes that better than creative industries. So I developed seven dual degrees across all those departments. 
And I've never seen grown men so giddy, like in the physics department. And you want to use our stuff to do like video games? How cool is that? <laughs> um, it was so great, but they didn't get it. The, you know, the, the echelons, just they, they didn't get it. Creative industries, I guess, I learned is a term that the UK really, it's really prevalent here in Australia. You guys just didn't get it. Um, <laughs> and I was not an academic. So I was not tenure track. I was the you know, professor of the practice. So very looked down upon. Um, no offense on anyone who's tenured here. <laughs> we don't have tenure here. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, so there was that. It was a great eight, eight years. I learned a ton. Um, and then I left Northeastern. I left my cushy um, academic job to do a startup company, which is something I had never done. This was another, like, an inspiration for students today. It's just, what have you never done before? What's scary as hell? You have no idea how to do. I'd never formed an S Corp and raised angel capital and written a business plan and done all that. So I did it. So uh, my buddy, George, who was the founder and ran the architecture program, very prestigious architecture program at Northeastern, he, he and I formed this company called Building Conversation. Uh, and it was a, this is, so this was roughly 10 years ago. Um, and it was a location-based mobile iPad, GPS located, uh, augmented reality visualization tool. So everything from tabletop, of course, this developed into like, you know, Pokemon Go and all this, you know, the stuff that's Instagram filters and all the stuff that's very common today. But uh, this was all brand new stuff. And then taking, you know, Revit models out of AutoCAD, scaling it up the real world, putting GPS coordinates on it so you could walk to the site. The iPad would know where the iPad is. It would know where the model is supposed to be. And then you could rotate it, scale it, um, step inside the virtual building and look out. It was really cool. Um, but anyway, so I did that, again, collaborating with kind of XR technology with an architect um, and students were very involved in that project. Um, so coming back now, to, so I've been chair for going on seven years now, and I think we've got nine student academy awards now. Mm -hmm. So it's driven to a very, very high level. A lot, a lot more medal winners as well that didn't that didn't actually win. But um, so it's so it's a very successful program. Uh, and I hope I can do this. I had it up before let's see if i can it's probably just easier for me to open up a new tab i, I just want to play you with two minutes to show you um you can open shift key mfa uh, vimeo it's so easy and we got oh here we go this is last year's i think i think <laughs> I had this set up. I had it. I swear I did. Come with us. I did. Yes, right. You did, right? Um, I'm gonna guess. We feel your pain. Yeah. All right. I have a captive audience. You're you're not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, we're not even going to get to see the password. Oh, yeah. Duh. How many academics does it take to type in an email address? <laughs> Let's see if I can get this through a full screen on us here. Bring. We have to wait, I promise. <laughs> oh, there we go. Wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. Oh, there we go. Uh, full screen. Wait a minute. It's the whole window. It did. It went away. <laughs> it went away. Hold on. Let me see if I can get up again really quick. All right. Here we go. All right, okay. Whew, tenacious. It's a word I teach my 10 year old. <laughs> okay, good. Volume. Can't really hear the volume, I guess. Mm. 
Uh, so since the volume's so low, I can talk over it. So this is just my latest graduating class. Um, crayon, Houdini, 2D, 2.5D, we have motion graphics. Visual effects. That was a good project. That was four young women worked on that together. That was a solo project. Just so you know what we're doing. Um, I'm, 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 I get something. Right, go back. Now, where was I? Well, mm -hmm. here we go. Did that. All right. So um, back to lenses. So, so different lenses. Back to lenses. I know this is the topic. Um, so I love being told, no, you can't do that or no, that's impossible, because I just roll up my sleeves and say, okay, get out of my way. <laughs> Ask forgiveness, not permission. Um, and there's one great example of that was that I had a great admiration for the king of independent animation, Bill Plimpton. So if you know about his work, it's all hand-drawn pencil feature films and going back to the 80s, multiple Academy Award nominated filmmaker. So I said, we should make a VR film from one of his films that was a first person, it's called uh, One of Those Days, uh, nominated for an Academy Award. And I pitched Google Spotlight Stories, which was a group run by Young McCabe at the time. And uh, they said, they know Bill's work and they saw his style and they said, well, that, it can't be done. Great, excellent, let's do that. So uh, this is Bill and all our storyboards in the back. So put together a team of current students, some graduates, some lo local CG soup on the left there, and my uh, tech staff, Jose, and we did it. And it was great. It was fantastic. Um, and we so we did it. So this is a 3D VR proof of concept of Bill Plimpton's style. So you can imagine, you know, it's basically what it looked like color pencil. And it, it animates just like his kind of basically color cycling with uh, with textures and things like that. Um, and with another great example of collaboration stuff that's never been done before, a different kind of combination of lenses, of, of styles, analog through the new XR technologies. Um, so creative industry. So international influence. This won't be long, but it's super important. That's why I'm here. I love, I've been really fortunate to be invited um, and to sometimes invite myself to, uh, <laughs> to, to go to places that I wanna go and explore. Um, so these are all places I've either lived or lectured or taught or um, visited. Uh, I've added one since then. I've been to Iceland. I'm going to add a pin. That was fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, I'm very embarrassed to say I've never been to Africa or the Middle East, uh, only because there's not that many computer graphic universities there that I can go to lecture at. Um, but I'm going to change that someday. There's actually a number of animation schools in South Africa um, that I'm looking to visit. Um, anyway. So I, I, I can't recommend it more highly to students and faculty out there too. I mean, I, it's probably obvious to everybody, but the, the benefits that I've gotten from the cultural influences, because the, the young people everywhere are virtually identical. Everybody wants to have fun and be happy and be successful and enjoy, and it doesn't matter where they're from. So um, it's great. So I just wanted to say how important that is to lifelong learning and uh, and the program that I have now is about 75% international students at, uh, at SVA. So the international aspect. So people behind the pixels is a phrase that I came up with and I've been using for quite a while now um, related to the history of computer graphics. So, and Andy knows my obsession with this, I think. Because um, I'm uh, volunteering with the, the SIGGRAPH <laughs> conference. A few of you, any been, been to a SIGGRAPH? Uh, this year's the 50th conference. You can get to LA, 50th anniversary of the conference. Uh, and I've been volunteering since 1988, I think was my first SIGGRAPH, um, until I was cornered into being the full conference chair in 2010. So this kind of really wrapped up all the topics I had been talking about, international collaboration, um, every kind of lens you can possibly imagine. But that was great. Um, with influencing 
the people behind the pixels, the history of computer graphics, um, trying to educate students. Um, so my mother still didn't know what I did for a living. So I wrote a <laughs> book, 500 pages. So it's a real book. Um, so I give it to my mom. Say, mom, okay, now you can understand what I did. It's also great for students, great for academics, great for producers. Uh, anyone wants a copy, I'll send it to you for free. This is not a pitch. I'm not, this is not a, a book selling. But it's, uh, it was great. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, but after the second edition and the Jap Japanese edition, I decided to put it online. So this is active. This is just my, my pet research that I do now, um, historycomputergraphics.com. And I want to mention this because, oh, what a coincidence. Um, you can basically, the equivalent of doom scrolling, you can dive in and everything and everybody, you know, in this room is related or worked with right, a project or a studio or a university or, you know, there's a co-author on a paper and it's it's all related to everything else. So and that I love about the collaborative aspect, you know, this cross-pollination of, of different lenses, the technologies and things. Um, and just highlighting, again, the people behind the pixels. So I think we're going to see Paul tonight. I think he's, he's in town. It's great. So, you know, I've got time. Um, and I hope to wrap up to, to have a, a little discussion, a few questions and things uh, when I'm done. Because I never know how much I talk too much about or not, not enough about. Um, so AI, um, the new normal. I was lucky enough to in, be invited to a, 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 a all day Symposium. We talked about this at, at SVA with uh, photographers and media people and philosophers, and it was so mind blowing um, to add a little bit to that. And I'm sure all of you are trying to desperately, as I am, to try to keep track of this uh, because it seems like almost every day there's some major new breakthrough. So, my point for students and this whole lifelong learning is. Um, I'm old enough and a, a student of history enough to know this is just the latest um, example of disruption of technology in creativity. Um, and the first thing that came to mind was, hopefully all of you have read this, I've got to reread it, David Hockney's book, Street Secret Knowledge. And this really resonated with me for a couple of reasons. Um, Techno Geek, right, it was all about, and if anyone hasn't read this or is not familiar, uh, he basically posits and, and kind of proves that 15th century Renaissance artists began to use the latest and newest technology that was available in their day, embraced it immediately, you know, lenses, camera obscura, things like that, because of course they did. You know, of course, you know, da Vinci is the most famous example of just a techno geek, you know, he's just engineer and, and all that. Um, so you know, going back at least to the 1400s, the 15th century, about this disruptive technology. Um, and the other reason I love this book is at the time that I read it, I was at Northeastern. So remember, production guy in a highly academic environment. And, um, and if some of you remember this, some art historians lost their minds when this book came out because <laughs> it, it suggested that the great masters weren't just great masters, they were cheating. They were yeah. using this technology, <laughs> right? It's like, how dare you, you know, <laughs> tarnish the name of, you know, all these, and I love that. I just like, oh, I got my popcorn and I love the discussions and all that stuff. Um, and then fast forward to only, you know, 120 years ago. And when the technology of photography was invented, of course that yet again was, it's not an art form, it's not creative, it's cheating. It's gonna put painters out of work. No one will, you know, art will not exist anymore because you can just photograph stuff. You know, sound familiar, right? Um, so I love this quote. The painter will have nothing more to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then fast forward again, although now it's already 40 years ago, but I remember <laughs> unboxing these. I'm, 1985, 86-ish, um, when I was in college. And there's that argument again, especially in gra I, graphic design was kind of the program that I had to get into to do computer graphics because it didn't exist. Uh, and again, the graphic designers just lost their minds because, oh, we're all going to be out of work and it's cheating and it's a shortcut and the computer's <laughs> going to be doing all the work and blah, blah, blah. You know, the same disruptive discussion coming up again. Um, and I think it all worked out 
pretty fine in the end. So now it's AI. And I was so proud of my students. So last September, kind of before the, this whole explosion, um, so I show up, as many of you do, first week of September, beginning of the fall semester, right? Uh, and I get the students in the room and I say, great, so show me what you're going to pitch and do for your thesis ideas. And they immediately threw up these images and just said, okay, so we used stable diffusion and uh, <laughs> blah, 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 like it was nothing. It was just another pencil to them, which of course is, that's all it really is. Um, so they put in these keywords. So I'm like, whoa, back up, back up. And then they used it, in my opinion, very appropriately. They, they generated these images from their own thoughts and concepts with just keywords. I mean, you, you all know how this works. And then from this, it was basically just their art department, right? So then they created their own unique work based on this inspiration because they kind of gave them ideas. Um, so it's like, oh, how hard can that be then? It's great. So um, these are, is this a, another image that they, is a team of two, two of my students did this together. Just gorgeous. I mean, really beautiful. It does have that aesthetic though, doesn't it? It hasn't, hasn't been unique enough yet that you look at an image like, oh, oh that's AI, but still. So, me and my, my hubris of the department chair and their professors, they say, how hard can this be? So I took, not their exact words, but I said, I can, let's see how I, I can emulate that. And I typed in the same kind of, you know, cyborg chorus and bio, and, and I get that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, wait a minute, something must be wrong. Um, and uh, so try it again, and I got that. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. New, new uh, appreciation for the, the skill of, now they call it a call, prompt engineering, right? Now it's a whole field of study. And I realized it really is, because you've got to put in, okay, with the 20 meter left, you know, and the angle of the light and the angle of this, you have to bring your art history and your fine art studying and your cinematography and your lensing and all that into your keywords to get something decent. So I worked at it, and this is what I eventually came up with, which... <laughs> Pretty cool, kind of neat, but it took work and it took creativity. And it's so this is directly relevant to the discussion, of course, that oh, our graduates aren't going to be able to find jobs and it's going to put you know artists and graphic designers out of work, and maybe a little bit, but I think I think there's still a huge amount of need for creative technologists for traditional techniques um, to be applied and uh. So I'm, I'm very positive. Um, and I, I had a whole another series of slides about asking AI to, to make um, an image of, of professors on stage talking about AI art. Um, <laughs> and it never got the number right. I always said four professors, and they were always like six. And they were all like white males too, which is <laughs> another whole, yes, another whole interesting discussion about you know, inherent bias and why does it do that? So then I just, I put in, in the style of Keith Herring, SBA grad, by the way, and did he graduate? Yeah, that, which is neat. Did he actually graduate? I don't know if he graduated, but he went there. He went there. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people went to SBA and didn't graduate. <laughs> Flipped on another exam. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's about it. Um, please stay in touch by any means possible. Uh, and I tried, I hope to finish a little early. Chris, what, 10.50? 10.50? Okay. Like 10 minutes? You've done enough Oh, excellent. So let's, so let's talk. So, oh. A question. Yeah, that's everything I've got. So I have a question which I sort of made a note of before, but actually you've just spoken a bit about it. Um, my question is about women-led computer arts projects. Right. And are there any unique or diverse content, form, aesthetic, or methodology, or is there no difference from the women-led projects to any other agenda? Interesting. Well, I can speak to it. Um, First person because, so we're very active with the uh, Women in Animation uh, group, which is, there's a UK chapter, um, it's very active in the States, and that's, it's, it's animation centric, but um, I think about- that Naked Women UK. Uh, yeah, WIA, yeah, Women in, yeah, women in, in Animation. And my, my department, through, um, I don't want to say coincidence, because it's th through merit, is about 70% women? Uh, in my department alone. It's just that all the photographs you showed, there wasn't any woman. 
represented. So I just wondered what you're. And they're all white dice. Were. Oh, interesting. Oh, the old ones, like from ILM, from yeah, yeah, yeah. anything yeah. you've shown today. I have really much diversity. <laughs> I just wondered um, what your actual experience was. In terms how do we know the gender of the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it's great. Well, I, I specifically mentioned that when I was asking about the AI. It's like, and it showed me five white guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 which is um, so. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to to women, the the every other kind of diversity in my program, it's, it's a very conscious thing on on ultimately on my part. And any of you who are uh, uh, run graduate programs, I have the luxury of handpicking each of my graduate students. So first, it's merit based, meaning portfolio. That is a recommendation. All that um, first, and then when we take that, my staff and I, then we say, okay, let's have an interview, and we do all that. So that's in fact this last class, the class before the twenty one. I had one hundred percent women in my. Jesus class. So I suppose my question, can I just go back to my question? Yeah, yeah. It's, going, it's going beyond that sort of mm. crude numbers thing. Right, right. Is are there unique is there unique or diverse content form, aesthetic and methodology? Are there any trends within your diversity groups mm. that would indicate a kind of difference of approach? You mean or, coming coming from the female? Yes, or LGBT or whatever, yeah. as opposed to the traditional white male right, right, dominance. Right, right. Um, let me think. So I think the diversity, <laughs> lowercase d, the variety of content, ideas, inspiration, creativity, I think the diversity of that is much more inherent across individuals irrespective of their you know, gender identity or their culture or anything like that which is what i love having such a widely diverse international program so i don't see anything like if i if i didn't know who produced the work there's nothing that i've seen oh well clearly a woman did that that's your question I, there's no like individual like aesthetic that i've seen come through i mean we're a really um, LGBT, very strong university as well, huge representation and support. For all so, so, so my question is, when people come with their portfolio, right. on your panel of people that look at the portfolio, right. do you have diversity yeah. represented? So that somebody might who might get missed out because they have a completely different approach that right. doesn't look kind of good to you, but it may be quite interesting from a diverse point of view, or does that not happen? Just to sort of, I'm just interested in this. Yeah, no, and I apologize if I'm, I'm missing the nuance of the question about, you know, do we, are you saying, are you, do we, do we see that, the difference in, in portfolio? When you choose, when you choose, you've got all these, yes, when you've got these applications that come in, you're looking at the portfolios, as you just said, and you're looking for merit. Right. You, what, you, so you've got a kind of criteria in your head that comes from your own experience. Right. Do you have the diverse people on your panel that might have a different kind of approach that could sort of say, well, actually, let's have a look at that person's work because they're coming from that position. Okay. Well, outside yeah, or outside, definitely. Like that. Yes, and and I can, I'll just speak for myself and not my panel of, of staff and faculty, but for myself. I love to see that really unique, and we all do that too, right? It's like if you listen to a piece of music or, or see a film or or something that like it just sparks you. It's it's unique. It's a unique perspective. It's something I've never seen before. It's very you know sometimes radical, sometimes, and very often it comes from these kind of perspectives. I love that. That's fantastic. I mean, that's that's the conscious curation of of, of me on my department of, of that kind of diversity. Yeah. So. Thank you. I uh, so uh, very interesting and thank you that was a, a lovely presentation and I'm sorry we were late um I was interested in the map that you showed of all the places you've been and you've worked oh, yeah. and how Africa was missing mm -hmm. and so my query to you is given that Nigeria has a massively kind of burgeoning film industry yes how can you find local partners to work in Africa with you? Because I actually think, you know, that is such a blank spot. Oh, and, and you look at this and it's like a map of empire, isn't it? You I know, know. even it's... the whole Middle East as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was pleased to say, very pleased to say, uh, I just spent a week at the Annecy Animation Festival in Annecy, France, just a couple of weeks yeah, ago. Yeah. And Africa had a huge pavilion, like so many countries were represented. Uh, and I met a couple of three gentlemen that I've, that I've, Followed up with and connected with, and and I'm going to invite to speak to my students because again the aesthetic is so different and culturally amazing, and it's you know it's so non-European and non-US. Uh, it's fantastic. 
So, and um, one of my colleagues um, who chairs the undergraduate department at SBAF Computer Ed, he's been to South Africa several times to speak at various colleges and things in their program. So that, that'll be my next place to go, actually, is, is South Africa. But yeah. and following well, up. Nigeria, the I'd say, Nigeria, the film yeah. industry there. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, familiar face. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also, I'm teaching architectural visualization, and we have also experimented now with two semesters of AI. And last presentation last week, we found out with my assistant yeah. that we will demand from the next semester on to get the prompts next to the image all the time, every time, mm -hmm. to discuss them. Mm -hmm. Look at the image, but discuss the prompts. And if you haven't shown the prompts either, I would like to see it actually. Yeah. <laughs> the prompts, you know? And okay. probably there's going to be kind of poetry in the prompts themselves that might become a completely different issue to talk about mm -hmm. and think about. And probably people are then like programmers, coders, mm -hmm. say, claim for themselves to be yeah. artists in coding elegantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that might be a field. Of... Are, are you talking about presenter notes or something else? No, no, no. Yeah. The prompt is what you type yeah. into, into yeah. underneath. What's there yeah. underneath yeah. the image? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I did actually list the, yeah. so these are, oh, that's all? Yeah. These are actually the prompts. Yeah, these are the prompts that they use to generate that. But that's too short for that image. Is the rest coincidence? That's, that's AI. For okay, you. because that's I, that's 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 all right, okay. That's all right. What I expect from my students is long prompts. That's exactly right. That's what I ended up having to do because I'm, you know, with a twenty meter, <laughs> millimeter lens from a twenty degree. Yes, angle that's exactly. Yes. Some set. Totally misunderstood that. Right. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about presenter notes. Uh, no, 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 the idea. You have to instruct these AI yes, images. Right. Right. Oh, what oh, to do. AI. In other words, like you know. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah, this would be this is the student creative contribution. Because we have to exclude, I think, for the students to make them apt for the future labor components, we have to exclude coincidences, even in this way, because they don't move the pencil, they move their fingers. Right. But they have to do it controlled. And if I argue with them about the images, I would ask. What is that on the background on the horizon? Is this is this an oil platform? Right. And if they don't answer yes, yeah. I say okay, go go home, come back next right. week. Yeah. Iterate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, that's right. yeah, yeah. And I might only have thirty seconds left, but I had a great discussion with an old friend of mine I had lunch with yesterday. That um, one of the discussions about this is authorship, right? Yes. Yeah. And we don't know where this came from. What what ten billion images did look at to decide to do this? We don't know. We can't find out, but it's not it's not easy. So. But my, I'll leave you with this. Uh, my opinion is how is what AI is doing to create that different than what we all do as artists? In other words, yeah, that's right. True. Every every doodle that I make is informed by my art history degree, my visiting museums, my listening to music, you know, music, my going out into nature. And I don't credit all of that. I make a doodle. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that different from what AI is doing? And I'll stop with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.